Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for Paul for inviting me to such a, a magnificent building. It's very majestic, uh, very beautiful indeed. And uh, I've known Paul now for some years. We met at the Bible College in Wolverhampton when Calvin Smith used to teach there, and that's where I met my brother as well, Steve. And uh, it's just amazing to see where God has, has brought him, because uh, I think in those days we were both kind of seeking where it was the Lord wanted us to go in the direction. And uh, it's just amazing to see his faithfulness. It's been probably over 10 years since those days, and to meet him after that, uh, such a long time and to see that he's still walking with the Lord, uh, which is a rarity in this day and age, uh, to see people still walking faithfully. Uh, today I want to talk to you about, uh, <clears throat> about forgiveness. I want to talk to you about forgiveness. If you would open up your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Matthew, chapter 18, and we're going to be starting in verse 23. Verse 23, it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon what was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents, but for as much as he had not yet to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me that thou hoist. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they, went, <clears throat> they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that the debt, because thou desirest me, shouldst not thou also have compassion on, my fellow, on thy fellow servants, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. And let's just pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. Lord, that we have the freedom to come and worship and fellowship in this country, Lord. And Lord, we just ask now that you'll be with us in the midst of us, Lord. I ask, pray, Lord, that you will be with each individual now as we go through the word. Lord, forgiveness is such a hard thing to do in the lives of men. And Lord, I know now that there's people probably in this room that are holding grudges, that are not forgiving people the way that they ought to be as a believer, Lord. Lord, we fall out with families, we fall out with friends. And Lord, we fall out with our workmates. Lord, it tells us in the scriptures that we should be holy men of God, seeking you, Lord, in our lives and remembering what you've done for us. And so often, Lord, we forget that. And Lord, I ask today that you will bring it to remembrance the things that you've done in our life. And help us, Lord, as we go out of this room today, back into our lives. If there's someone that we're holding grudges against, someone we're not forgiving, Lord, help us to deal with that today. Speak to us, Lord, from your word. I ask, Lord, Father, that you'll be with each and every person here. As the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine to see if you are in the truth. And Lord, help us this day to examine to make sure that we're in the truth. And I ask as well, Lord, Lord, oftentimes I come here in this pulpit, Lord, and ask myself, why, Lord? Why me? Not worthy, Lord. But, Lord, you've chosen me to be the vessel today to communicate your word. And I ask, Lord, Father, that you'll be with me. 
And Lord, that you'll put your words in my mouth. Lord, that you will enable me to speak to the people today. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, my message today is entitled, Failure to Forgive. Failure to Forgive. Today, we're going to do a brief introduction. We're going to look at uh, why should we forgive? What are the consequences if we don't forgive? And how we should forgive? How do we do it? <clears throat> In America, there was a man called Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway. And he was known as the Green River Killer. He was a serial killer. He had killed over 48 women. And he was arrested, and rightly so. And he was... Pleaded, he pleaded guilty to every single case. The court, uh, the judge at the court read, read out one case, he says guilty, over and over again, 48 times. And he was called to the court to uh, be sentenced, and because he pleaded guilty, he could get away with a death penalty. So he knew he was in prison for the rest of his life. One after one, the family members were given a chance to say what they thought about this man. And you can kind of imagine what would be going through the hearts of these people. They'd lost daughters, wives, mothers. And these are some of the things that they were saying. One of them stood there and looked at him and said, he's an animal. Another woman said this, I wish for him to have a long suffering, cruel death. Another lady said this, he's gonna to go to hell and that's where he belongs. Each one said this, and, and Gary Ridgway looked into their eyes, stone face, not a sign of emotion. Didn't move him at all. And let's be honest, each one of us, if we'd been in that situation, would probably feel the same. We'd feel hatred for, towards such a person. One of the fathers of the victims stood up, and he said these words, he said, Mr. Ridgway, there are people here today that hate you. He says, I'm not one of them. You have made it difficult to live up to what I believe, and that is what God said to do, and that's to forgive. And he said these words, he says, sir, you are forgiven. And at that, Gary Ridgway broke down and cried. Forgiveness is powerful, very, very powerful. MacArthur says this, For never are you more like God than when you forgive, but never are you less like God when you will not forgive. Ravi Zacharias, the Christian apologist, says this, We all need to forgive because we all blow it. All of us, we all blow it. Forgiveness then, in God's eyes, is very, very serious. Very serious. In fact, in this chapter, the entire chapter is based upon forgiveness. And Jesus takes a little child and he sits the child amidst the disciples. And he, he begins to use the child as an example, saying this is the way that you should be. You should have a heart like him. A child is dep dependent on his parents and you should be dependent on God. But you shouldn't cause people to sin and you shouldn't sin against people. And he starts to give these examples of, of a child's heart and the way that we should be. But then in verse 15, he starts to talk about how we should deal with people that have sinned against us. How we should deal with people that have sinned against us. And you probably know the passage where it says that if your brother's in sin, you go to him. Just you and him. And you try to fix it. If he does not listen to you, then it says bring two or three witnesses. And if he still does not listen to you, he says bring it before the church. And if he still does not listen, then he says, treat him like a heathen. Now, the audience is Jewish. Heathens were untouchable. And that's the attitude he's saying that we should have towards this person. Now, the question I want to ask is this. What was the sin that he committed? Was it adultery? Was it fornication? Was it gossip causing the split in the church? What exactly was he doing? Look at verse 15 of chapter 18. The Gospel of Matthew 18, verse 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, and you go and tell him his fault between thee and him, 
and if he shall not hear thee? In other words, if someone sins against you and you try and fix it, they've sinned against you, they've trespassed against you, and you go to that person and you try and fix it with that person, and they don't want to fix it. In other words, they are not willing to forgive. They are not willing to change. That is how serious God sees it. He's saying you take it down the entire channel of church discipline. That if someone is unwilling to forgive another Christian, God sees it as something very, very serious. Unforgiveness. Very serious. Now Peter went on to ask a question after this in verse 21. If we just read that, it says... And then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? It's a response, really, of kindness in that day. Because according to the tradition of the day, it was at least three times, minimum, maximum, sorry. For example, Rabbi Joseph ben Anan said this, He who begs forgiveness from his neighbour must not do so more than three times. Another rabbi of that day, Joseph ben Yadaya, said, If a man commits an offence once, they forgive him. If a man commits an offence second time, they forgive him. If he commits offence a third time, they forgive him. But a fourth time, they do not forgive him. And you see that Peter is kind of being very, very kind to that attitude of that day and age. But Jesus responds, look at verse 22. It says, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now if you do the math on that, that's 490 times. What does he mean by it? That seven times, seven, 490 times that you forgive someone? Should we wait until someone gets to 490 and when they do 491st time, we say, that's it, I don't have to forgive you anymore? I don't have to give you any more forgiveness because you've gone over the line that Jesus said. Or is it really, should we even be counting? Should we be saying, well, he's, you know, you've heard this, people say, this is the third time I've told you, or this is the third time I've forgiven you. Should we even be counting? What really Jesus is really saying here is it means unlimited forgiveness, that it should never end. We should never stop forgiving people. In fact, in the passage that's parallel to this in the Gospel of Luke, he says one day, if we, do, if we are sinned against that many times in one day, can you imagine that? 490 times in one day, Jesus says still forgive them. 490 times in one day, still forgive them. It's no surprise after Jesus had said this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verse 15, in the parallel passage, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith, increase our faith. Now, why do you think they would say that? Because it's humanly impossible. Naturally, we cannot forgive people like that. Let's be honest, at that court case, we would probably be saying the same things. You're an animal. You deserve what you get. We would have been saying the exact same things. Why? Because it's not humanly possible to forgive in such a way. It has to come from God. And that's what God expects of us. He expects us to forgive. But why should we forgive? Why should we forgive? Now, we just looked at that story in, in uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 23. If we quickly go there again. It says this, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And what Jesus is doing here is really applying this to God. God is the king. A king has a kingdom. And the people of the kingdom have to come and give an account of what they do in their life. And he's saying that these people would come to the king to give an account of how they dealt with the money. And then verse 24, One man is singled out. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Now let me just put that in perspective for you. The revenue of uh, Judea, Samaria, and Udamea, which is the safe part of Israel, was 600 talents. And the revenue of Galilee at that time was 300 talents. 
If you total the entire revenue of Israel, it wouldn't have even come close to his debt, 10,000 talents. And what is Jesus trying to show in this story? He's trying to show that this man had a debt that he could not pay. It was impossible for if he, even if he started to try it and pay it, he would never pay it in a lifetime. It's impossible to pay that debt. And it's a picture of us that before God, our sins, just like the prodigal son says, he says, I have sinned to heaven. It literally, in the Greek, it literally means up to heaven. And when he came to his father and asked for forgiveness, he says, I have sinned up to heaven. Our sins are so many, it's impossible to deal with them. In fact, even if we had one sin, it's, we still can't fix the problem. This is what the story is reflecting. God has forgiven us so much. He's forgiven us so much. So he begins, the king begins to, the process of regaining some of that money in verse 25. Look what it says. It says, but for, so, for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife, his children, and all that he had payment to be made. And so what starts to happen is this. He is then sold into slavery. Secondly, his wife and his children are also sold into slavery. Then all of his possessions are taken away from him. So he has no more possessions. Literally, he has nothing. He's reduced to nothing but a slave. Pretty harsh. Pretty harsh. And you can imagine what was going through his, his mind. Look at verse 26. It says, But the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He couldn't pay that debt. It's impossible to pay that debt. And it's the same with us. It's impossible to pay the debt of sin. Our sins piled up to heaven. How can we pay that back? That's religion. That's when we try to bribe God. And we're saying, God, let us do the good works to cover up the bad things. No. It's impossible. We can't do that. Only God can do it. And then we see the grace and the compassion in verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. He loosed him, he let him go. And then we see the hypocritical behaviour. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that, what thou, uh, that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he would not, and he went and cast him into the prison till he should pay the debt. A hundred pence, a hundred denari, denari. That one denari is a day's wages. This man could have paid him back if he was given enough time. But he refused to forgive him. And then we see the report. Look at verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told, and came and told it unto their Lord all that was done. And then we see the reminder. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And when his Lord was wroth, till he, should, uh, he delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. And we'll stop there. So why should we forgive people? By a quick, we went through that very quickly. But why should we forgive people? Because of the amount that we have been forgiven. Because the amount that God has saved us from. One sin is sufficient to put a man in hell. And our sins are piled up to he heaven. If we were to count our sins, we could not do it. If we were to, just in one day, how many bad thoughts do we have? We couldn't do that. It would be embarrassing. So the entire story then paints that picture, the situation that we're in. And really, I just wanted to get through that quickly because I want to get to this. What are the consequences if we don't forgive? We've been forgiven and we've been entrusted to forgive. And as we read at the start, we know more like God than when we're forgiving people. So what are the consequences if we don't forgive? 
Now, this is one of the things that I go through when I'm counselling someone, when I have issues in the church, when someone's not forgiving someone else in the church. First of all, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're in verse 26. <clears throat> it says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let, the, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Okay, there's a passage there and it tells us that when we sin against each other, when we're angry with each other, we're not to allow the sun to go down. In other words, we don't let the day pass. And this is something that I've always done with my wife. If we ever fall out, we try to deal with it before we go to bed. And we'll explain, I'll explain why in a moment, why we need to do that. But look at verse 27, which follows on. It says, neither give place to the devil. Why is it that we are to deal with it and deal with it quickly? Why don't we just leave it for a few days? I hear people say that sometimes. Oh, let them calm down. Why do we have to deal with it quickly? It tells us there. Because it will give place to the devil. It will give place to the devil. Now the word there for place, is a, the Greek word there is a military term and it means a beachhead. You remember in the Second World War when the Americans came over to Britain and we were about to uh, enter France? We had to get a, a beachhead. We had to get on the beaches of Normandy, a base of operation. As soon as we had a base of operation, uh, we, were, we were good to go. And that's what this word means. If we don't forgive people, if we allow sin in our lives and we leave it and linger it, we give him an open door, a base of operation in our life. Satan can begin to work in our life. In Hebrews chapter 12, if we go there, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says this, Follow peace with all men. In other words, don't fall out with people if possible. And holiness with which no man shall see the Lord. Look diligently lest any man shall fall of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby, thereby many be defiled. So why is it that we shouldn't allow it to linger and we should deal with it quickly? Because Satan will have a foothold and then we have a root of bitterness. Now, Bitterness, we all know what that is, but what's a root? A root is the base, the foundation of a plant or a tree. And the bigger it grows, the more roots you need. And the roots will go into the soil, they will find every gap, every space, every crevice, every crack, and they will cling to it. And what Hebrews is telling us is that bitterness is the same in the mind of a believer. That if we allow ourselves to be bitter towards someone, it will start to get a grip of us. So strong, we will not be able to break it. It will be harder and harder to break. It, you become shackled to the past. This is the sort of things that I see in ministry with people that won't forgive. They become shackled to the past. They're always bringing up, oh, well, so-and-so did this, and I can't forget it. Another one, they like, it's like picking at an open wound where they know it hurts, but they keep going back to it. They can't leave it alone. You have, uh, sorry, every conversation becomes an opportunity for slander. So every time someone talks about that person, oh, guess what, I know, and it goes on, and then they start talking about that person. It takes over thoughts, emotions, and situations. Every part of your life becomes deep-rooted in that problem, all because you never dealt with it quickly. Satan got a foothold, and you slept on it, and now you've got a problem because it's deep-rooted. And worst of all is this, when you start to narrate in your mind. And what I mean by this is when you say, well, when I see that person and they say this, I'm going to say this. Or when they do this, I'm going to do this. We all do that, don't we? And every time I ever say that in a message, everyone kind of nods in agreement because we all do it. We all narrate in our minds how we're going to deal with the situation. It's deep-rooted. We need to deal with forgiveness straight away. Not only that, it torments the mind. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. On both sides, 
It will torment the mind on both sides. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 5. Now, this man had been church disciplined. We're not sure 100% what he'd been disciplined for. We're not sure if it's the guy from 1 Corinthians 5 that had been cast out of the church and he'd been returned to the church. But in verse 5, but if, it says, But if any man cause grief, he have not grieved me, but in part. So in other words, he'd sinned against Paul in some way, but only a, a small way, that I, I may not overcharge you all. Verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. In other words, the, the many people put him out of the church. Verse 7, so that contrawise you ought to rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with, oh, uh, up with over much sorrow. So what's happened is this man, it appears, has come back to the church wanting repentance, forgiveness, and the church was still pushing him away and saying no. And Paul says, he will be swallowed up in his sorrow. You need to forgive him. You have to forgive him. For this end also I did write that I might know the proof of you, whether you are obedient in all things. Uh, look at verse 11. The reason we should do it, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, his tricks. Why should we forgive people? Because it will give Satan an advantage. Why were they uh, pushing this man out of the church and not forgiving him? What was happening? He was giving Satan advantage. We have to forgive because it will cause torment in that person's life. I'll give you a couple of stories. Um, I, I did a funeral a, a few years back of a man in our street where I was brought up and I knew him from when I was a child. He was there before I was there. And he was the man in the street. Everyone knew him. Okay, I won't say his name. Uh, and everybody knew this man. He, he would sit on his doorstep and he would talk to people every day. And later on, when I was doing the funeral, I interviewed people for the funeral and so on, find out who this person was, what he was like and so on. I found out that he would counsel people, he would help people, he would say to people, why are you, why are you looking so sad today? And he would try and encourage them, talk with them. He really reminded me of the, you know, the, the judges at the old, in the Old Testament who used to sit at the city gate because of where he lived in the street, you couldn't get past him. You had to go past his house and some people wanted to avoid him. But he was there for the community. Now, we had a next-door neighbour and I knew the neighbour as well. He was a young man. He was a happy-go-lucky guy. He, he was always happy and whenever you would see him, he would always encourage you and he was always saying, how's your family, how's your friends? You know, he was a really nice guy like that. Well, he was at this funeral, and obviously, he was upset. And I preached in this funeral about this man, about how he was good to, for the community, and how he, he, you know, he helped people and so on. And, and then afterwards, I saw him, and he was so sad, and I was talking to him, but he didn't want to talk to me. He could not maintain eye contact with me. And I knew something more was wrong than just being sad. And I found out later that this man was his carer, and he was taking money out of his pension. And he was overstricken with grief. He didn't know what to do. The family would not forgive him. And everybody found out about him. He was tormented by him. This is what happens when we won't forgive someone. It torments the mind. So much so that one day he got up. He could not deal with him. And he went out and took a rope and hung himself on a tree. Shocking. And yet the family talked Christian. I don't think they were Christian, but they talked Christian. But they couldn't forgive this man for what he had done. At our college, we have students there and they have to live at, uh, at the college itself. And some of them are young and they're still learning in the faith. And there was a group where they would separate themselves from one particular man and he would constantly phone me up tormented by the fact that they wouldn't and I had to go up there and, and, and really deal with them all and address this issue and say look you've got to, you, you're Christians you shouldn't be doing this and I went through pretty much most of what we're going through today really and yet still even after that they still carried on and day after day they would phone me up he would phone me up sorry saying, I'm tormented by this, tormented. Forgiveness torments people. It really hurts 
It hurts when you know that you're not forgiven or it hurts when you want to be forgiven and you're reaching out and the other person isn't willing to forgive you. So, there's the first consequence that we give Satan a foothold. We give Satan a foothold and it brings in bitterness. In Galatians 5, 9, let's go there. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9. This is something else it does. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. See, the bitterness just doesn't stay in your life. It starts to permeate everyone else's life and the people around you. And people will start to notice something's wrong. It goes, it's amazing, really, when you think about it, because it goes from something that's just inside of a man and spreads to other people. I'll give you an example. This issue we had with the college, it spread all the way to Manchester. It went all the way to Norway. It went all the way to London. People were emailing me and telling me we know about this situation just because someone could not forgive someone else and they couldn't deal with it. Here's another reason. You will not enjoy forgiveness from God. If you do not forgive, you will not enjoy forgiveness from God. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive them not, forgive not them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. But what does that mean? Does that mean that we've, that's it, we're done for? It doesn't mean that. If you refuse to forgive someone else, you are cut off from meaningful communion with God. One of the things I show people who won't forgive Christians who won't forgive is the consequences it has on their life they think it's all about the other person but in reality things are happening in their life it means that you're cut off from meaningful communion with God go back to our passage in Matthew chapter 18 and you'll see what I mean Matthew chapter 18 and we're in verse 32 then his Lord, after that, he called him and said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that thou doest, because thou desirest me. Then he says, Shouldst not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even though I had pity on thee? But then it says, And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now this isn't talking about hell, because notice it says, Till he should pay. In other words, it would come to an end at some point. Hell doesn't end. This is till. In other words, he will hand him over to the tormentors. Who were the tormentors? Well, in that day, it would have been people that would have tortured him. But what about us? Because it applies to us. Look at the last verse. And this is the bit we tend not to read in the same context. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If you don't forgive people, you will be out of communion with God. But also, God will hand you over to the tormentors. What does that mean? Well, it could mean all sorts of things. It could mean that your job might not be too happy place to be. God can make it that way. It might be that things just don't go the way that you want them. In 2 Corinthians, it talks about God giving Paul a tormenting demon a demon to torment him, to harass his life. And you said, really, would God do that? He did it to one of the most faithfulest New Testament men we know of. Will he do it to me? He did it with Saul. He will torment us. And that's what I'm saying. It's a tormented life to be in a position of unforgiveness. That's worrying. That's what it says there. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. Who is he talking to? To Christians? To believers? He will hand us over to a tormented life. And that's what I see in ministry. When people come to me with a lack of forgiveness, I will ask them that question, how's your life? And oftentimes I'll use that word, it's torment. 
Why? Because you're not forgiving people. Another thing, you fall out of fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 2. Look at 1 John chapter 2. And we're in verse 9. I'll find you. It says this. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even till now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness, uh, darkness sorry, has blinded his eyes. It means that not only are we not in fellowship with God, but we're not fellowship with men. It will affect every aspect of our life. How can we honestly stand in a church or amongst Christian brethren knowing that we can't forgive someone else uh, and, and, and pretend God forgave us? And so because of that, that fellowship is broke. The Bible says we're in darkness. Now, that doesn't mean you're unsaved. It means that the fellowship is broke. And you know what that means as a Christian. If you've, like Paul says this morning, when you feel dry, when there's something empty, you've got to go back to the Lord. That's why the Bible says every day we pick up our cross and follow him. We have to seek him every single day to make sure that that fellowship's there. But when we break that fellowship because of sin, that's something different. We've broken fellowship because of a lack of forgiveness. Also, you will not enjoy the love of the brethren. You will not enjoy the love of the brethren. Look at Matthew chapter 18 again. Verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told it unto the Lord all that was done. The people around you will know there's a problem in your life. They'll know that there's a problem there. And what do they do? They all go and tell the Lord. As the pastor of the church, Paul will vouch for this, people will go to him. And I have people coming to me, what's wrong with so-and-so? What's wrong with so-and-so? Everybody will know. So there's a break in a fellowship. We have someone in the church now, and they will not forgive someone. Whenever they walk in the church, there's like a black cloud over their head. And everyone else, they kind of want to stay away from them because it, it, it affects them. And this is what's happening. It affects your fellowship with God. You've given a foothold for Satan. It brings in bitterness. It breaks your fellowship with Christians. Can you see why it affects us more than it affects the other person? And most of the time, the other person doesn't even know we're offended with them. It bothers our life more than it does the other person. But, you know, it, it even goes further than that. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And verse 9. 19, sorry. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So someone who says, I'm not going to forgive that person, is basically saying, I'm going to get the revenge. I can't trust God to do it. So I'm going to do it. Really what you're saying is this. I am God. You're blaspheming. If you don't forgive someone, you're saying that God can't deal with it as good as I can deal with it. God can't sort that person out the way that I can do it. That's acting like you're God. That's blasphemy. Can you see why God takes it so serious? Forgiveness hits every level of life. Every level. God is far better able to deal with offences than you are. God is far greater than you. And he can deal with the situation better than you can. The thing we have to do is give it over to the Lord. And we'll look at that in a moment. But here's another one. Matthew chapter 5 verse 23. So we see that we give Satan a foothold. Bitterness takes root. 
we see that we fall out of fellowship with God, fellowship with brethren. It's the equivalent of blasphemy because we're trying to play the role of God by, you know, getting our revenge. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, look what it says. It says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother have aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First reconcile to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So what is he saying there? He's saying that even when you come to worship God, there's a problem. This is talking about the temple, and people would bring their offerings and their sacrifices, and God's saying, I don't want it. Go away, fix the problem. Our worship, your ministry, whatever it is you do for the Lord, isn't acceptable to God. It's not a sweet savour and smell. It affects pretty much every area of our spiritual life. Even when you come to church and you want to sing a song to God and you think, God received this worship. God's saying, I don't receive that worship. Go back, sort it out with your friend and then come back. You're unfit for worship. Here's another one where we're in Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And what is he saying? He's saying that if we can forgive people, it leads to righteousness, yeah? So if we don't, what does that mean? It means that we've forfeited a blessing. To forgive someone is a blessing. A right response makes it a trial that produces righteousness. A wrong response makes it a temptation that produces unrighteousness. So when someone crosses our path and does something wrong to us, we should see that as a blessing, an opportunity to minister to someone, to receive a blessing from God, to love your enemy. But in fact, we take offence and we want to take revenge. We give Satan the foothold. We lose fellowship with God, fellowship with men, and our worship's no good to God. So the question is, in light of all of that, how do we forgive? How do we forgive? Well, first of all, in that story, if you remember, it was really telling us to remember the story of what Christ did. Not just what he did on the cross, but the entire humiliation of his life. That almighty God emptied himself and took on the form of sinful man. I mean, that in itself is an embarrassment for the Lord. But he had to do it for us. For my sins, for my offences against him. Born in a manger, a feeding trough. Brought up in, uh, in persecution. Then he moved to Galilee, to Nazareth, the poorest area in Israel. You imagine the worst area in your area, we all have them. Jesus lived there with a poor family. We know he had a poor family because of the offerings he gave in the temple. God never brought him up with a rich family. He brought him up in a poor family. He did that for you. In his life, rejected by his own brethren, his own brothers. His own people, the Jews, rejected him. Handed over as a, as a thief, as a murderer, as a, a, as a betrayer of the, of the Roman people and accepted in place was Barabbas a man a sedition a seditionist a, uh, guilty of treason he was let go free for Jesus beaten crucified humiliated do you ever think about that that's the first place we should go when forgiveness uh, is, is short in our life. The first place we should go is the cross and ask ourselves, what did he do for me? You know, that should fix it straight away. Let me give you another way. Change the way you view offences. When someone offends you and does something wrong against you, change the way you view them. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible talks about different types of Christians. It talks about natural, uh, sorry, baby Christians, carnal Christians, and spiritual Christians. Spiritual Christians are Christians that are mature, that can deal with issues and deal with problems. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. Look what it says. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another, 
And he's saying that everyone in the church is fighting, judging each other, falling out with each other. But look what he says. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? One of the best ways of dealing with uh, offences is to take them. Admit that you're wrong, even when you're not wrong. My, me and my sister, we organised a party for my dad. He was his 60th birthday. And it just, I told her before, and I says, these things cause, his fa cause families to fall out. And she, she would, no, we won't. And by the end of it, it had happened. And in, I just says, it was my fault. I just took the entire blame. I knew what I had to do. It's better sometimes just to take the wrong, say, yes, it's my fault. Just admit the wrong. Even if you're not in the wrong, it's better to be wronged. Here's another one. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 3. I like this one. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, of a man's judgment. Yes, I judge not mine own self. How do we deal with it? Just make it a small thing. It doesn't matter. What matters is the kingdom of God. Seeking him. This is a small thing to me. Another thing we can do is this. If we go for the four-step program that God gave us anyway, we could say five-step program because the first one is deal with it inwardly like we've just looked at. But if you feel that you can't deal with it there, the Bible says go to your brother and talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Now, that doesn't mean text message him or send him an email. It says go to your brother. You've got to go to the person and speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. And try to win them over. Do it with gentleness and kindness and meekness. And he says, if it doesn't work, then you go and get some people, some witnesses, two or three witnesses. Galatians 6 1 tells us who they are uh, spiritual men. It says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. We need spiritual men to go with you and try to restore the person. If they still don't listen, it says, then you bring them before the church. There's ways of dealing with it. And how I wish, I really wish that the church should deal with things this way. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that's lacking. I go into churches, I visit a lot of churches. I'm not saying this of yours. I know Paul very well and I know that he would definitely do this. But I know a lot of churches that won't do this. That they won't deal with sin in the church. How can God be glorified in a church like that? So we go for the four-step program. Uh, another one is remember they might do it again when people sin against you they might do it again it's an ongoing process when someone sins against you don't just stop there and say oh, I'm sorry and then move on because sometimes you have to work with people it's an ongoing process they might do it again but like Jesus says you forgive them again Here's the, probably the best. I think this is the best way of dealing with offences. Seek good for the offender. What does the Bible say about your enemies? Love them. Seek good for the offender. Love your enemies. Make them the centre of your prayer life. You've got a problem with someone. Start praying for them. Start praying for them. I guarantee you that that will deal with the issue. You will start to see things in a different light. You notice that we'll complain, complain to men and we'll say bad things about people to men, but we won't say it to God. We won't go to God and say nasty things about people. Why? Because we think that we're in that little closet. That's the only time God's listening. No, he's listening all the time. Pray for them. Seek the best for them. I like to ask this question when people come and start complaining about someone. I just kind of kill the conversation with this one statement. Do you love them? They can't answer that. Because it instantly deals with the issue. Because if you love them, you will sort it out the right way. You will know exactly how to deal with it. Do you love them? Forgiveness means to wipe the bill clean. It means to declare the person innocent. So that means we leave it there. Look at Proverbs chapter 19. Here's another reason we should forgive. Proverbs chapter 19. And verse 11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, 
And it is his glory to pass over a transgression. You need to be the better person. When you forgive someone, you overlook a transgression. The scripture says that's to your glory. You're the better person then. Even if it means you've got to be in the wrong. You know, Jesus was completely innocent. And yet they still crucified him. Who's the one that's glorified now? He is. He's the one that's glorified. I was uh, kind of strolling through uh, the internet looking for some things on forgiveness when I was p putting this together. And I came across this news report of this mother. Her name was Mary Johnson in America. And her son was murdered at a party. And the man or the boy that did it was 16 years old. And she, she couldn't forgive the, the, the young man. He was in prison, got life. Uh, well, 22 years is life now. Uh, and she wanted to confront him and tell the truth, how she felt. So she went to the prison and she started to talk to him. And it wasn't long before she realized that this boy was basically, or this young man was going in the same direction her own son was going in. And he was just caught up with the wrong people he had the wrong role models. And she started to talk to him and visit him more and visit him more. And in the end, she told him, I forgive you for what you've done. And now he lives next door to her and they get together every day and pray together and seek the Lord together. And that's true forgiveness. Where you don't hold it back. You don't hold the bitterness. Hard thing. It's not humanly possible to do it. It has to come from God. You know, you've got to remember it takes two people to reconcile. You might go to someone and ask for forgiveness and that other person will hold the hand back and not want to forgive. Well, that's their problem. You've done what you can do. You've just got to have the right heart. But you've got to remember that if you don't forgive, there's consequences, serious consequences. So serious, the Bible tells us that we can be church disciplined for a, a lack of forgiveness towards other Christians. So serious, God says, that Satan can have a foothold in your life. So serious that God says it will break our fellowship. So serious that God says it will affect the fellowship of your brethren. So serious that when you come to church and you think that you're doing your ministry... And you're, it's acceptable to God. God says, no, it's not, it's not accepted. Forgiveness is very serious in God's eyes. And the reason it's serious is because that's what God's about, forgiveness. You are the most like God when you're forgiving someone. And you're completely opposite when you're not forgiving other people. And Romans 12, 18 says these words. It says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You will not please everyone. You will not please everyone. But you've got to try. And I know that even in my life, there's people that I don't get along with, but I still try. I still pray for them. It's hard. I remember my mum, she used to own a pub. Uh, anyone know the Wingwa? You know, the, she used to own that pub. And it was a very rough pub, known for fights and you know, drunken brawls and so on. And I hadn't long been saved. I'm in that side about two years. And I went to visit her. And I'd gone through the bar and I'd gone into the back room, into the living quarters, and I heard a commotion. And I, I knew there was no men working that day, only my mom. So I thought my mom was in trouble. So I went out. And there was a man there behind the bar, ready to beat up my mom. You know, what, what does a man do? And my brother was there. My brother's more mouth than action, as they say. He's a big guy. He looks intimidating. And he started having a go at this guy. And I knew this guy well. And I knew that he would do something bad to my brother. I, know, I knew that he would take him out. And I know that he would have took my mum out as well. And it was one of the hardest things I have, I've really had to do. Because I know that I could have dealt with him. Physically, I could have put him aside. But I had to stand between him. And I looked him in the eyes and I said these words. I said, please don't hurt my family. And it really broke me to do it. I can't believe that it was so hurt with his pride. But I knew that it had to be done. That's what God wanted. 
And he kind of laughed at me, but then he walked away. You know, the Bible talks about that a soft answer defers anger, doesn't it? Forgiveness, that's what it's about. Who are you not forgiven in your life? It's probably hurting you more than it's hurting them. Let's pray. Father, Lord, Lord, when we look into our own lives, Lord, we're not perfect. Every day we have bad thoughts about people. And we think bad things. But Lord, I pray that, Lord, by looking at what we've seen today, Lord, it will at least give us a helping hand to become more like your son, who, when he was hanging on the cross, says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, who offered his cheek, who was willing to sacrifice himself for us, Lord. And Lord, in our lives, sometimes we just don't want to give people the time of day. Lord, I pray that the people that we're hurting in our lives, Lord, that we will go to them today and fix it quickly. Lord, that you will help us just to deal with the problems that we have. Lord, that your name be glorified. Lord, even if it means taking wrong, even if it means that we become the offended ones, even if we're innocent in the whole situation, Lord, Lord, it only makes us more like your son. I pray, Lord, today that as we leave, if there's people we need to forgive, let's take the message today and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.